When a crisis hits, people often respond emotionally driven by fear. This emotional reaction can cloud judgment and make it difficult to think critically or rationally about the situation. During COVID-19, for example, much of the focus was on the immediate biosecurity threat rather than the broader financial implications. In a future crisis that severely impacts Americans' ability to engage in economic activity or drastically reduces purchasing power, we could expect similar reactions. People would likely demand immediate policy responses, pushing for any solution to alleviate the crisis without necessarily considering what the best course of action might be. In such situations, calm and rational public debate is rare. Instead, governments tend to step in, recognizing the public's fear and emotional state. The population typically clamors for a quick fix, and the government, in response, implements a solution that may not have been thoroughly debated or considered from all angles. When a major crisis occurs, people tend to react emotionally, often driven by fear, which can hinder their ability to think critically or rationally about the situation. These emotions can dominate public discourse, making it difficult to have thoughtful discussions about the most effective policy responses. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, much of the focus was on the immediate biosecurity threat, with less attention paid to the longer-term financial consequences. The urgency of the situation led to swift actions, but not all of them were thoroughly debated or analyzed. In moments of crisis, there's often a heightened sense of urgency, which can lead to hasty decision-making. If a crisis were to arise that severely impacts Americans' ability to participate in economic activities, such as a dramatic collapse in purchasing power, we could see a similar dynamic. People may feel desperate for immediate solutions, placing pressure on the government to act quickly. In this scenario, fear and anxiety would likely dominate the public's reaction causing people to demand rapid policy responses without fully considering the long-term implications. Public debate in such times is rarely calm or rational. Instead, the government often steps in, recognizing that the public is scared and emotionally driven, and responds with solutions designed to address the immediate crisis. However, these solutions may not always be the best course of action in the long run as they are implemented quickly to satisfy the clamor for action. The challenge is that, in the midst of a crisis, it's difficult to have the kind of thoughtful, measured discussions needed to explore all options and make the best decisions for the future. Subscribe our channel and press the bell button to get our video notification and like the video. The U.S. Treasury Department has long been a revolving door with Wall Street, particularly with firms like Goldman Sachs. Over the past several decades, former Goldman Sachs executives have frequently held key roles in the Treasury, often during times of crisis. For instance, Robert Rubin, a top executive at Goldman, played a pivotal role in the Clinton administration as Treasury Secretary, where he helped engineer the repeal of Glass-Steagall, a move that many argue contributed to the 2008 financial crisis. When that crisis hit, George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary was Henry Paulson, another former Goldman Sachs executive. Paulson allegedly warned members of Congress that if they didn't bail out the banks, martial law could be declared in the U.S., during the COVID-19 pandemic, the fiscal response was once again led by a former Goldman Sachs executive, Steve Mnuchin, who served as Treasury Secretary under President Trump. This pattern of Wall Street executives taking the reins of the U.S. Treasury in times of crisis highlights the close ties between government and major financial institutions, raising questions about potential conflicts of interest and the influence of big banks on U.S economic policy. The U.S. Treasury Department has seen a revolving door with Wall Street, particularly with executives from Goldman Sachs occupying key roles during major crises. This close relationship has raised concerns about the influence of big financial institutions on U.S. economic policy. A prime example is Robert Rubin, a top Goldman Sachs executive who became Treasury Secretary under the Clinton administration. Rubin was instrumental in the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which had previously separated commercial and investment banking. 
Many argue that this repeal set the stage for the 2008 financial crisis by allowing banks to take on excessive risks. When the 2008 crisis struck, George W. Bush's Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, was also a former Goldman Sachs executive. Paulson played a central role in the government's response to the financial meltdown, famously warning Congress that without a bank bailout, martial law could be declared in the U.S. This level of influence from a former Wall Street executive during a critical period further underscored the deep ties between the Treasury and the financial sector. The pattern continued during the COVID-19 pandemic, when the fiscal response was overseen by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, yet another former Goldman Sachs executive. Mnuchin's role in shaping the economic response to the pandemic raised familiar questions about the potential conflicts of interest that arise when former Wall Street insiders hold such powerful positions in government. This ongoing trend highlights how deeply intertwined Wall Street and the U.S. government have become, particularly in times of economic crisis, and raises concerns about whether policies are being crafted in the public's best interest or shaped by the financial elite to protect their own interests. I believe the direction the powers that be, however defined, are leading society is toward a two-tier structure where the middle class becomes obsolete. What we are moving toward can be described as a neo-feudal system, where a large underclass is managed by an elite ruling group. This dynamic resembles a form of technocracy, a system of governance where decision-making is based on technological and scientific expertise, often at the expense of democratic processes. This concept of a technocratic society, sometimes referred to as a scientific dictatorship, has been discussed by various thinkers. One prominent figure is Dennis Meadows from the Club of Rome, an organization with a long history of influencing global thought on sustainability and economics. The Club of Rome has connections to other influential entities like the World Economic Forum, which have become increasingly visible in recent years. These organizations often advocate for top-down approaches to managing global challenges, which raises concerns about the potential for increased control over individuals and the erosion of middle-class power in favor of elite governance. I believe the direction society is heading, influenced by powerful entities is toward a two-tier system where the middle class becomes increasingly irrelevant. What we're seeing is the emergence of a neo-feudal structure, where a large underclass is managed by a small, elite ruling group. This elite class holds the reins of power and influence, while the majority are left with diminishing opportunities and reduced influence over their own lives. This system can be more accurately described as technocracy where governance and decision-making are dominated by technology, science, and specialized knowledge, often at the expense of broader democratic participation. The idea of a technocratic society, sometimes referred to as a scientific dictatorship, has been discussed by various thinkers who warn of its implications. One prominent figure in this conversation is Dennis Meadows, a member of the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome is an organization that has had a significant impact on global thinking around sustainability, economics, and governance. Its influence is intertwined with other high-profile groups like the World Economic Forum, which has become a symbol of elite power in recent years. These organizations often advocate for centralized, top-down solutions to global challenges which, while presented as necessary for managing issues like climate change or economic inequality, raise concerns about the concentration of power in the hands of a few. This concentration risks sidelining the middle class, reducing social mobility, and creating a society where the majority are controlled by a small technocratic elite. The increasing visibility and influence of these entities suggest that we may be moving toward a world where democratic input is minimized and decisions are made by those with the most resources and expertise, regardless of the broader public's needs and desires. Subscribe our channel and press the bell button to get our video notification. And like the video.